Hello and uh, welcome to Grenada Reports, live with the latest across the northwest. Hello, thanks for joining us on the programme this evening. They covered up their failings to protect their reputations. The report into how police and council officials responded to the widespread sexual abuse of young girls by Asian men in Oldham. For some victims, the agony goes on. Now, the message that goes out from that is that they are not listening to victims. That was the first time she knew that all along they had the identity of two of her rapists that she had never been told. We'll be asking the leader of Oldham Council whether girls are still being targeted there. Also tonight. Coming down the track, a week of chaos on our region's railways as we brace ourselves for three massive strikes. How will they affect you? He's doing great. How Misha is making a new life in the Northwest after escaping the war in Ukraine. We're meeting the owl and the pussycat who've materialised in Merseyside. And it's what I'd call holiday hot over the next few days, but it might start to get a little too warm and more humid by Thursday. All the detail a little later on. Well, first tonight, it is a familiar story. Agencies more concerned to protect their own reputations and protect people at risk of serious harm. Yeah, that's the conclusion of this highly critical report. It looks at the response by Greater Manchester Police and Oldham Council to the sexual abuse and repeated rape of young white girls by Asian men in Oldham. Both organisations are accused of covering up their mistakes, although they were cleared of actually colluding with the abusers and allowing them to get away with it. Worryingly, the report also says the grooming scandal in neighbouring Rochdale could have been tackled earlier. Incredibly, the ringleader of the Rochdale abusers, Shabir Ahmed, worked for Oldham Council, but the police failed to tell them when he was arrested for sexually assaulting children. Yeah, we'll be hearing from the council leader and a barrister who deals with cases that involve abuse after this report from our correspondent, Elaine Wilcox. The report into historic child sexual abuse found girls as young as 12 repeatedly raped by Asian gangs. The victims were failed by the agencies meant to protect them and their pleas for help ignored. Some of the offenders were identified but never investigated. But there was no evidence of a widespread cover-up, more flaws in safeguarding, which allowed the abuse to continue. We've spoken to a survivor known as Sophie. She was abducted from Oldham Police Station after reporting abuse and then was raped by multiple men. He assaulted me, invited four other people um, who all assaulted me. Shaquille Chowdhury was jailed in 2007 for raping her, but the review found he'd named two more offenders who were never investigated. There was a concerted effort to silence Sophie, to block her voice from this review. Now, the message that goes out from that is that they are not listening to victims. That was the first time she knew that all along they had the identity of two of her rapists that she had never been told. This report paints a harrowing picture of young girls being raped and passed around by Asian men. One of them, Sophie, had to fight to be part of this review. The detective who blew the whistle on the Rochdale grooming scandal said she was being silenced again. Today, Greater Manchester's mayor has ordered the police to work with her foundation. They've referred 33 cases of abuse in the last six months alone to the police and are demanding action. We've heard of serious failings in Sophie's case and then we hear that she was silenced from this review to cover up failings, serious failings. What does that say about your culture now? Any, any attempt in our culture to put our reputation before the well-being and welfare of vulnerable people is just wrong. And it is that that we are determined to correct. What went on with Sophie is absolutely indefensible and I read that report and I'm sure like everybody else I was horrified and she wasn't protected by the council and by the police as a 12 year old but then to reinforce that trauma as an adult as well 
um, is absolutely appalling. Shabir Ahmed was the ringleader of Rochdale's infamous grooming gang and was employed by Oldham Council, but police and the authority failed to investigate complaints about him, which could have prevented further abuse. Greater Manchester's new Chief Constable had this message to offenders. If you think you have got away with it, you are wrong and we are coming for you. Sophie and the other survivors want those who abused them and those who failed them to be prosecuted. Elaine Wilcox, ITV News. Well, tonight we're joined in studio by Barrister Harriet Johnson, an authority on the issue of violence towards women and girls, uh, who we'll chat to in just a moment. But we're going back to Elaine in Oldham before that, who has the leader of Oldham Council with her. Elaine. Yes, that's right, Lucy. With me is Amanda Chatterton, who's only been in post here at Oldham Council for a month. Thank you for joining us. What do you say tonight to Sophie to convince her that no other child will suffer the horrific abuse she did? So, firstly, on behalf of Oldham Council, I could not be more sorry to both Sophie and all those victims referenced in that report. What Sophie went through as a 12-year-old, no child should ever, ever have to go through that. And then to do what we did and let her down as an adult as well and not be honest and not apologise was wholly unacceptable and I wholeheartedly apologise for that. Were you aware just how big an issue this was before you became leader? I was aware that we'd asked for the review in 2019 because of concerns regards to CSE. Um, and I've, I've been a councillor since 2012, so I can only speak since then. But and the report says we knew that CSE and grooming was an issue and we tried to be honest and open about that. But what I wasn't aware was that political drive, how it didn't always translate into good practice at the front line. Um, and a lot of that report surprised me. And like I say, I was horrified by what I read in that report. You were quite emotional today because you're a parent yourself. But, you know, how big an issue was race and the sensitivities over race uh, for people turning a blind eye, not believing the girls? So I don't think that was an issue at all, and that hasn't come out in the report. And when we look back, the way we understand CSE grooming today is totally different to how we understood it in 2011 or 2006. And the report does highlight there was some really good practice and Oldham seen, was seen as a system leader. But the reality is we weren't a victim-focused strategy, but it wasn't just us, that was up and down the country. But it had nothing to do with race, and the report does highlight the fact that politicians said at the time, irrespective of race or religion, the reality is the perpetrators are defined by being evil men who perpetrate some terrible, terrible crimes against really, really vulnerable children and young women. Now, we understand one of your members of staff was in welfare. He abused girls for eight years. You must be stickened, and all the other members of staff. Could that happen again under your watch? With regards to that member of staff, so there's nothing in the report that says he abused girls while he worked for the council. That came, it was actually brought to our attention two years after he left the council. That will be reopened and looked at, though, as will all the other cases. But our systems are completely different now, and a lot of that was around data sharing with Greater Manchester Police. Um, and that doesn't happen now. You know, we have a safeguarding team that sits within the police station, and in terms of escalation and data sharing, it's totally different. But safeguarding children is a daily challenge, and one we go through every day. Okay, well thank you very much for talking to us and one charity that we've spoken to today says they are supporting girls, 300 girls this year who are at risk or being groomed here in Oldham. Okay, Elaine, thank you. Let's bring in Harriet Johnson, barrister, who's in the studio with us. Just to pick up on that final comment there from Elaine, 300 girls in Oldham who are now at risk of being targeted by uh, abusers online. That is a, that's a terrible number, isn't it? Absolutely terrifying, and especially when coupled with the revelations that we've seen in the report about the police and council response to those risks, it's really alarming. Harriet, why do you think the authorities got it so wrong? Because on the face of it, it looked like the police, the council, simply didn't care about these young girls. I can see why people would draw that conclusion. I can't say that police and council don't care, and I think there are very many good people who go to work in these areas because they want to help people. The really concerning thing in the report to me is not just that mistakes were made, but the attempts and the, the greater interest in covering up the mistakes than in addressing them, putting their own interests above the interests of these girls. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely appalling, isn't it? And, and it's so depressing to hear that again. We've heard these claims in the past, haven't we? 
That's one of the things that's so distressing, I think, to many of us reading these reports and particularly reading today's report. And I was watching the press conference given immediately after the report was published and the chief superintendent of Greater Manchester Police effectively telling us that lessons have been learned. But of course, while these offences and these events took place in 2011 to 2014, we need to remember that it was in 2020 that Greater Manchester Police was placed into special measures for failing to record 80,000 crimes. We concentrate a lot on what's gone wrong. How the heck are we going to put this right, though, and guarantee the safety of girls in these areas? I think that's quite a big question, but one of the, the answers that the report reveals is proper communication and proper working between the various agencies that are supposed to be protecting these girls. Another huge part of it is cultural change. One thing we saw in this report and that we saw in other investigations, like in, in the Rochdale abuse scandal, is the belittling of the girls making these allegations because they come from very impoverished areas. They're not given the same weight as investigations made by other people would be. They're inherently vulnerable and yet they're given less protection by the police as a result of it. Do you think that we need now a, a sea change in the conversations that we have, the sensitivity surrounding culture and religion? I think we definitely need a sea change in the conversation about, about violence against women and girls, and especially around vulnerable girls. I don't think um, race or culture has ever been an excuse not to investigate a crime, and police officers certainly, when they join the police, take an oath to investigate without fear or favour. So to investigate a crime committed by a person of a certain ethnicity isn't a racist thing to do unless you do it in a racist way, which is a whole other problem. Thank you. Thanks so much for coming in to talk to us. I, I suspect we're going to return to this subject, which is another depressing thought, but thank you very much for coming in to talk to us tonight. OK, let's move on to more news now. And tomorrow's rail strike, which will, of course, cause disruption and misery for tens of thousands of commuters this week. Yes, yeah, services will be wound down tonight in preparation for the strike, which starts tomorrow. Although it's a national strike, it will also have an impact on local services. Yeah, workers are also walking out on Thursday and Saturday. So that means timetables are severely affected all week and into the weekend. Let's cross to our correspondent, Mel Barham, at uh, Preston Station. Now, in Mel, this strike is over pay, jobs and working conditions, but will mean widespread disruption for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely, Gamal. It's fair to say this is going to cause a lot of disruption for anyone who relies on the railway to get around. This is going to be the biggest rail strike in a generation. Not for 30 years have we seen a walkout like this, and that is why rail passengers are being told to brace themselves for quite significant disruption over the coming week. As you say, this is just going to be the start of a three-day walkout affecting tomorrow, Thursday and Saturday. Uh, and as we're told, we're told that um, it's not going to be much better for the non-strike days either. Now, here at Preston, everything is running actually pretty normally right now, but the picture is going to be very, very different tomorrow uh, with a hugely reduced timetable. Uh, it's going to be affecting the whole of the northwest with about 20 to just 25 percent of normal services running. And we're being told that those services are going to start a lot later at 7.30 and finish a lot earlier at 6.30 in the evening. It's also going to affect Mersey Rail, despite the fact that their staff aren't actually walking out. But it's because it's the signalling staff and maintenance staff from the RMT union who will be walking out. And Mel, the RMT union, which is striking, is stressing that this isn't just about pay and conditions. That's right. They are also concerned about working conditions and they're very worried about what they think is going to be a large number of jobs that are at risk. Meanwhile, the government today say that striking should be the last resort. They say this is going to affect businesses who are already struggling after COVID. They say it's going to stop passengers from choosing to travel on the railways and that will risk jobs. Well, despite all the disruption that this is going to cause this week, the passengers that I've spoken to today, there does seem to be a degree of uh, sympathy and support for those RMT workers. I've just put my friend on a train. She's not going to be able to get into work at all next week. So it's kind of a kick in the pants. <laughs> Stupid, really. It's just a bit fed up. I will just get a lift from somebody or just ask my workplace to just give me some time so I can just reach there just a bit late if it's possible. But I understand why it happens. 
happens a lot though and there is a lot of money that people do pay travel. Well, of course, this isn't just going to affect rail passengers. The roads and buses are going to be a lot busier as well. The message from Network Rail and the other rail companies tonight is do not travel unless you absolutely have to. And if you do, have a plan B. Well, thanks very much for that. Um, here's what's all to come on the ITV News at 6.30 with Charlene. Coming up, the latest ahead of Britain's biggest rail strike in decades. Last-minute talks today failed to stop the walkout. We'll have all the info you need about the disruption ahead. And it's not just train passengers facing problems. EasyJet announced cutbacks to their summer schedule and... Charter cut a loft at club. What a shot! We hear from Matthew Fitzpatrick after his landmark win at the US Open. So join us for those stories and more from 6.30. An 18-year-old boy has been airlifted to hospital after an explosion at a house in Burnley. Emergency services were called to Sefton Terrace. A 17-year-old girl has also been taken to hospital. A number of nearby homes have been evacuated and some roads in the area are closed. Lancashire police are asking people to avoid the area. Two people have died after a helicopter crashed into a field in North Yorkshire near the Lancashire border. It happened in Burton, Lonsdale, six miles from Kirby Lonsdale. Specially trained police officers are supporting the families of those who died. Emergency services are still at the scene. A full investigation into the cause is underway. Now, in the first of a series of reports to mark Refugee Week, we have the heartwarming story of the 16-year-old boy from Ukraine who's found himself a job at a restaurant in Greater Manchester. Misha Chumak and his mum, Yulia, were forced to flee their home in Kyiv when the Russian invasion began almost four months ago. The pair have since found sanctuary in the northwest under the Homes for Ukraine scheme, and though they haven't been here for long, Misha has already become a valued member of the team at San Carlo in Hale Barnes. Our reporter, Emma Sweeney, has been to meet him. Good afternoon. Your pasta arrived. Thank you. Misha Tumuk from Kiev isn't one for taking things easy. The 16-year-old and his mother only arrived in Manchester two months ago, but already he has a job. I prepare all the things to serve, like um, olives, cheese, something, and I, I wipe cutlery. And then uh, when orders, uh, when people order something, i waiting for the kitchen to make it, uh, then serve people. The teenager has taken on the role at San Carlo as he awaits to sit his GCSEs next year. And like any job, it's not just about the labour. It's also very much about the co-workers. They are really welcoming and uh, I felt like I've been working here for a while. And since you've been here, have you picked up any of the local lingo? First word I heard as uh, cheers, as thank you. When I just came, it, it sounds a little bit ridiculously. <laughs> Do you like to use cheers now? Do you say Yes, that? yes, I, re I really got used to it. And as Misha gets his head around the new lingo, the restaurant has started hiring more Ukrainians. It's all thanks to Steph, a founder of Manchester Homes for Ukraine. She's been using her links to help others rebuild their lives. My son works at San Carlo and he's quite proud of what we were achieving as a group. He mentioned it to the restaurant manager and the kitchen manager and they just came and said, you know, if you've got any people that need work, absolutely they can come here. And although Misha has only been here for a matter of weeks, he's already held in high esteem. When we first met Misha, we were blown away with his uh, positive attitude. And, uh, and once we got to know him, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's a hard worker, he's very polite, very confident, and we're really, we're really happy with, with, with the way he is. Misha and his mum, Yulia, seen here on the left, are being hosted by Zoe and Martin Cohen. They've been helping the pair settle in. But all the while, the teenager's thoughts are never too far from home. He makes regular calls to his father, who's serving in Ukraine. And like so many, Misha hopes the war will soon end. Until then, he's making the most of his opportunities here in the northwest.
Excuse me, can I get this yes, dirty? Yes, thank you. Wait, oh. great. Cheers. Emma Sweeney, ITV News, Manchester. Yeah, good luck, Tim. OK, on to sports news. Blackpool's new manager, Michael Appleton, says he wants to work together with fans to be successful at the club. Yeah, there's been a mixed reaction from supporters to his return after his first spell in charge a decade ago lasted just 67 days. He's been speaking to our sports correspondent, David Chisnell. Ten years after he was first appointed Blackpool's manager, Michael Appleton is back for a second bite of the cherry. Or should that be tangerine? Last time, his reign lasted just 67 days and 12 games before he left to join Blackburn. But the former Lincoln and Oxford boss has returned to the Championship Club after Neil Critchley left to become Stephen Gerrard's assistant at Aston Villa. Well, Michael, back at Blackpool, did you ever think you'd be back managing here? Um, possibly. I mean, it's one of them where you can never say never. Um, I'm delighted, first and foremost, to get the opportunity to, to come back and manage the football club, and especially at a time where... Obviously, there's such a feel-good factor about the place. Obviously, we've had, you know, two years of, of success under Neil in terms of firstly promotion and then being really competitive next, uh, last year. And we, we want to sort of continue that. I suppose a lot will be made of when people look back at your first spell and they say, oh, it only lasted 67 days, you only lasted 12 games. How do you reflect back now on your time? I chose to leave at the time. I had my reasons for that. They were probably, well, they were exactly the same reasons that the majority of the fans boycotted at a certain stage. So I think we're on the same side when it comes to that. So for them to get the opportunity like I have now, to go and sort of maybe show, prove uh, what I am capable of. And I'd like to think the last two clubs I've managed have shown that anyway. I just hope I get the opportunity to do it for a longer spell here. Well, with Blackpool's controversial previous owners, the Oyston family, out of the club since 2019, Appleton is now excited to work under the new owner, Simon Sadler. But are the fans happy to have him back? Michael Appleton is your new manager. How do you feel about that appointment? Well, it's not my first choice, really, because they were here and he only lasted 11 games, I think it were. So I don't understand, really, why he's back here. Appleton has left us before. Will he do it again? Obviously, that was under a different regime. Obviously, we trust in Simon Sadler, and that's what we do. Let's see what he does. Um, the jury's still out, let's just say. Do you feel you will have to win some of the fans over? We spoke to some earlier, and uh, mixed reaction. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if, it, if, if we're talking about football and CVs and records, and I've got nothing to sort of try and defend, I think when there's a realisation that first time around I left for all the reasons that they sort of boycotted the games, I think there'll be an understanding between both of us and we'll hopefully work together and be successful. Appleton's first spell with Blackpool was the shortest managerial reign in the club's history. After signing a contract until 2026, he hopes his second spell won't be such a brief encounter. David Chisnell, ITV News, Blackpool. And just over a week since the TT races finished on the Isle of Man, a race with a slower pace. The traditional parish walk took place over the weekend with more than a thousand people. They walked 85 miles through all 17 parishes. Paul Atherton, last year's winner, crossed the line first again in just under 15 and a half hours, eight minutes ahead of his nearest rival. Oh, that looks like really hard work, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, ouch. Um, now, we all know the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat <laughs> uh, with plenty of honey and money wrapped up in a five pound note. Probably got that wrong. Now, dozens of owls and pussycats have sprung up all over Knowsley as part of a new culture trail. Yeah, Edward Lear, who wrote the famous poem, lived at Knowsley Hall and got his inspiration there. Paul Crone wants to find out more. If you've a minute on your hands, if you've time to spare, there's a tale to be told out here in fresh air. OK, not quite the calibre of Edward Lear's children's poem The Owl and the Pussycat, but there's a brand new culture trail across the borough of Knowsley featuring owls aplenty and pussycats galore, paying tribute to the poem's author Edward Lear, who put pen to paper in his time living at nearby Knowsley Hall. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a £5 note. Isn't it great just to come across something like this and, and be able to talk to people about it and get people chatting about the Borough of Culture and Edward Lear and what this is all about and how it tells the story of the serious nonsense poems in the Alan and the Pussycat. 
Each of the sculptures has a different theme. In Prescott, there's William Shakespeare. Is that therefore a barred owl? Or can we tempt you with Alvador Dali? Get it? There's even a couple outside Whiston Hospital liking the hearts. In total, there are 82 large and medium sculptures to visit. And with a convenient app to use on your mobile, there's a day of free entertainment for all. People can, you know, go across the whole borough and find them. They're often in town centres or parks where people can get to. Um, and they're just really good fun. Little Stevie Arabella seemed very interested in the sculptures until... Oh, uh, yeah, no, that, that's... A, that's a... <laughs> More impressed with this group of cyclists who certainly gave two hoots about the new culture trail. Oh, I think they're lovely, they're fantastic. Such fun to go around spotting them all and getting your picture with them. It's just a lovely, lovely thing to, to do, really, and it's a lovely day to do it in the sunshine. Of course, the poem does have a happy ending. The owl and the pussycat get married, and hand in hand, by the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon, the moon. They danced by the moon. All right, all right, I know what the last line is. We're just pausing for dramatic effect. We've spoilt it now. It absolutely is nonsense, isn't it? And I think part of that is because, you know, people say this part of the world's got a great sense of humour. So we hold on to things that are really good fun, don't we? And I think that you, you'll have seen walking through Prescott today that people just want to have a laugh about them, talk about them, and it just seems to um, gather interest and people know the poem, don't they? The owls and the pussycats are on view until September. Paul Croner, ITV News, Prescott. Yeah, I'm sure there have been lots of lovely <laughs> pictures there. OK, let's get on to the weather because it's great. Plenty of sunshine, terrible pollen. Here's Kerry. Now that is brew weather. And only boiling what she needs. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Big up you, sis. Hello, very good evening to you. What a lovely day to start the new working week. Mostly dry, plenty of sunshine and those temperatures are very respectable. Low 20s, just about as much as I could possibly cope with. Head to the coast over the next few days as the temperatures start to rise. There'll just be a slight westerly breeze there, making it feel more pleasant. And although we've had some whispery high cloud today and there'll be some fair weather cloud over the next few days, it really is quite settled until the end of the week. Very jealous of Finn's outlook there. There. But yes, keep pets and people safe and hydrated and protected over the next few days because those temperatures are going to rise and by Thursday they're likely to peak at 27 or 28. Not quite as hot as it was for us on uh, Friday last week. It got to just under 30 degrees. The United Kingdom was 33 and that was part of a heat wave over the past few days across all parts of Europe where Spain had its highest gene temperature ever 44 degrees. So for this evening and overnight tonight, mostly dry, clear spells and light winds. Towns and cities staying just about in double figures, but in rural spots we're down into single figures tonight. Nothing too cold, but certainly a little fresher in rural spots. Very sun times for tomorrow, 4.40 and 9.45. As we head into tomorrow, another dry day, plenty of sunshine. We have got a weakening weather front trying to push its way into the Isle of Man and Cumbria later on, but we think it's probably just going to produce maybe a light spit over higher ground and further south, a high of 23 Celsius. Of course, tomorrow is the longest day, the summer solstice, and then that UV risk stays pretty high over the next few days with plenty of sunshine, climbing temperatures possibly 27, 28 by Thursday. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Two sugars, please. Oh, lovely. Hello, Summer. Piri sponsors ITV Pollen Count. Avoid around sunset being outside because as the air cools, the pollen starts to sink to ground level. Coastal areas with a little bit of an onshore breeze, the best it will push the pollen inland. Otherwise, it's very high over the next few days. Uh, bring on Thursday, 27 degrees. Love yeah, a bit of that. Watch out for that pollen, though. It's horrible. Bye-bye.